looking at is a monster from some bygone era. It's time to show Kong that man is king. Kong is such a huge part of the mythology of cinema, and it tells this incredible story of man versus nature. Every part of what the original Kong is the best individual pieces of cinema. It doesn't feel derivative of something that you've seen before. You know, in the very first story, Kong is referred to as Kong, the eighth wonder of the world. Kong exists to inspire wonder. He was on buildings, sweating down planes. It was high adventure for us. I don't know anybody that's ever seen one of those movies and hasn't been captivated by things we've never even thought of before. The exciting thing became, how do we tell a new story within that mythology? How do we take the things people loved about Kong and reinvent them not for reinvention's sake, but for a reason that solidifies why this movie should exist? This is a different thing. This isn't man versus nature. This is man versus God. Jordan has an extraordinary visual imagination. Good, reset. He was sending me concept art that he was coming up with, and he's conceived of it in his mind in a very brave and bold and original way. And when the question was proposed of, hey, we want to make a new Kong movie, my first response was, why? Why do that? The 1933 movie is incredible. It is film history. Peter Jackson's version is an incredible remake of that Beauty and the Beast story. And for the first time, we don't want to tell the Beauty and the Beast story. Jordan came in the door with this idea for setting the movie in the 1970s, which we thought was really fresh because uh, it's the dawn of the Landsat program, which was the first time we started mapping the Earth with satellites. Ready for seismic charges. There was still a sense that out there and beyond the far reaches of the world, there may be places we didn't yet know. The early 70s was still a time when like the hippies believed that, you know, the world was gonna change and there was an innocence to that time that I think is perfect. Perfect way to approach the story. Mark my words. There'll never be a more screwed up time in Washington. It puts it into perspective because we know what the 70s was. We know politically what that climate was. It's gritty, it's not pretty. To end the war and bring peace with honor in Vietnam. It allowed for us to play with a bunch of characters coming out of the fog of the Vietnam War and going into this new, uncharted, dangerous place and contending with a place that's far more dangerous than the conflict they just left. Commander in the sky, commander on the ground. I'm commander wherever I am. At this point in 1973 in human history, we no longer had a balance with the world. We were actively destroying the world. We were destroying myth. And so to take these people to an island where it's untouched by man. And so there's a pureness to it. There's a catharsis to it. We're leaving the world that is falling apart. And suddenly we're in a pure place. And then you go to that pure place and then you're put back in the food chain. In this iteration, Kong is being reconceived as a myth come to life. He is truly monstrous in size and scale and scope. It's this giant beast, and it's initially very easy to fear something that large and ferocious. And it's when you begin to respect and acknowledge the humanity that exists in this, this creature that it, it draws you closer to it. He's not a gorilla, he's not an animal, he's not a you know beast, he's a being and he's just something that we don't understand yet. He is the last of his kind. He serves a very necessary function on the island because he keeps the other creatures at bay, and there's a balance there, and that's Kong. Kong is king. I mean, he's the biggest thing on this island, and yet he defends when he needs to, but for the most part, he's actually a quite peaceful character. Kong as a character had a bit of empathy and a bit of pathos, 
and and you saw a childlike quality in him. You saw uh, his brain ticking. Kong's a pretty good king. This is his home. We're just guests here. The journey of Kong in Skull Island is that he goes from being a, a figure of terror, an alpha predator who seems to be a destructive threat, but he becomes a emblem of the natural order. Kong is God on this island. He's the only thing keeping them lizard things in the ground. He's right, Colonel. We can't kill Kong. Now that other creature, that's the threat. You have the military in one camp and you have the scientists on the other. When they do eventually crash and end up trapped on Skull Island, you see how the different skill sets from each group kind of come into play. You are going to tell me everything I don't know or I'm going to blow your head off. Everyone has a different agenda, and I think we represent the different facets of humanity and our approach to controlling the unknown and dealing with fear. Then it's about how the different people reconcile this thing to be a higher power. That's what became exciting, and that's why it's important that our Kong is that tall and that big, because it carries a weight to it. It carries a grandiose quality where you look at a speck of a human in the shadow of the Colossus. In the center of all of this, you have a woman who's fighting for her rights and is showing a new way of being a woman, creating a female character that's much more dynamic and more hands-on than what we've previously seen in the movie. When I first started talking to Brie about it, it wasn't about this woman who needed to be saved. There's people like you lost us support back home. You're not actually gonna blame the people without guns for losing the war, are you? Camera's way more dangerous than a gun. If anything, she needed her own saving internally, as everybody in the 70s was sort of spiraling to figure out who they were. You didn't strike me as a war photographer. Anti-war photographer. And being a woman doesn't just mean that you're like beautiful and sort of sit there and wait to be, to be grasped and taken a hold of. Women are right there on the line, on the ground, making it happen and working just as hard as the men are, but there's still an energy there that's, that's feminine and that is working with it. Get down! She has no weapon. She's just interested in photographing the truth. We made a conscious choice with this movie that I wouldn't have uh, any weapon through this. Because I do feel like although she's grappling with what the camera means to her, she's trying to find a fragment of it to take back, to be able to share and, and make a change in the world. And she hopes that with the power of these photographs, there will be a way to protect these things instead of constantly feeling like the answer is war. These men did not die in vain. Well, I just like the fact that Packer's a warrior who's very loyal to uh, his men. He does have a huge resentment because Kong is killing his men. So it becomes his mission. I became Ahab, he was my white whale. There's enough munitions on that down sea stallion to finish the job. Packard's war with Kong is as futile as screaming into a hurricane. Kong is a force of nature. We're going down! Hang up, Reeves, I'm coming! Kong is protecting his home, and Packard is protecting his men, and they're both in situations that they have no control over. You understand them both. It's about who really is the monster. And there's this point where that kind of turns, where Kong is the threat, but then we realize that the threat is really the, the human characters who come into that environment. I think all of these characters, to some degree, are kind of dented cans trying to figure themselves out. I like characters with imperfections. I think that flawed characters and the flaws of characters are what make them memorable. Die, you mother f This 
this movie is not just escapist entertainment, you know, it, it is, but at the same time, as a metaphor, the movie is about our world right now. Conflict, how to resolve conflict. People that believe like, if it doesn't work at first, get a bigger hammer, that kind of point of view. The film will function as a fantastic, breathtaking piece of spectacle, but I think there will be a, a commentary on the responsibility we have as human beings with our destructive tools. Hopefully they think about their role in the world and think about what role myth plays in their life, what role nature plays in their life, what symbiosis they have with the world, you know? But more importantly, I just want them to walk out and have had fun. The thing about Kong Skull Island to me is that it's all of these different things. You know, it is a genre mashup of 70s films and very contemporary films, and, and hopefully we can sort of fuse the throwback elements and the very modern elements into something that becomes kind of timeless. It's amazing. Oh, okay. We just fundamentally are trying to treat our Kong in a way that honors what came before it, but paves a new path. That's Kong. He's king around here. He's God to these people. Kong is film history. It's what blew open the doors for so many people on what was possible or imaginable with cinema. What we're doing is trying to pay homage to that and then create something incredible and new and fresh. When we first started talking to Jordan about the project, he really emphasized how much Kong is so unique as far as what he represents not only as a character, but as a technological innovation with each uh, iteration of him that's been out there. This Kong is completely new. The scale with which he's been conceived is vast. He was just the king of the monster movies and everything else that came with it. So now to have this opportunity to be able to revamp the Kong in a new era of technology, it's incredible. Some of our early animation tests were very primate-centric. Kong walking on all fours, acting like a traditional primate. The director immediately responded with, whoa guys, this character is not a gorilla. This is a evolutionary offshoot between man and gorilla, kind of a Neanderthal. Our Kong is much more of a movie monster. He has gorilla-like anatomy, but everything's pushed to the extreme. He has a much more prominent chin and his lips are more defined. It meant we really had to blend what we saw in the human reference and what we saw in the gorilla reference. We modeled and showed it to Jordan. He's like, push it further. He really drove back towards a lot of the key elements of that 33 Kong. He's 100 feet tall. And the reason that we did that is because it became exciting and important to me that when people step foot on this island, their first response is to look at that thing and say, that's a god. Our Kong is closer to the 33 version of the character. With that comes a lot of different challenges. Our biggest challenge right off the bat was going to be the fact that he was 100 feet tall. He walks upright. How do we film him for a anamorphic movie with a very narrow aspect ratio? Uh, the lead's about 100 feet. Great. A lot of times we would use a program that we've developed here at ILM called Cineview, where you can load up Kong on an iPad. This is our Kong visualizer. Basically, we can put Kong in here. And so here he happens to be laying down, but we can move him around. And it's really just a tool designed for visualization on set. To help poor uh, hampered uh, <laughs> camera operators figure out what to do. He's probably one of the densest models we've built. I think it was over half a million polygons, almost half of the polygons in the face because in the close-up shots, you see every detail, all the wrinkles. So we wanted to have the resolution in the face. 
We have shots of Kong that go right into his eye. So we knew that his skin textures and his eyes, they all had to hold up to very, very extreme close-ups. A lot of shots were just gonna be his foot or just his hand. At 100 feet tall, we were going to be seeing every single part of him in detail. Initially, we did do a couple of capture sessions with Terry Notary and Toby Kebbell, and that was mainly to have the director work with a performer to find who Kong is and get the very fast iterative feedback from those performers who have a lot of experience doing primate performance. Those capture sessions did provide reference for animators to base their shots on. When you transfer motion capture to a 100-foot tall creature, it's a very different thing. And we ended up keyframing a lot of the film. Keyframe animation puts the majority of the responsibility for creating a performance in the animator's hands. We have to give the animators a control system so they can actually animate him. Once we got the animation back, we had a muscle system underneath. So we would simulate those muscles. And then we would have another layer, which is like the skin, which would simulate with the muscles so you could see the muscles underneath the skin slide around. Like the shoulder blades, you can see shoulder blades move and they slide under the skin. And then, after we had all that, then we would actually have the hair. He's covered by about 19 million hairs. You can sort of do an initial distribution of those through the software, but a lot of the, the detail styling and sculpting of the hair is all done by hand. You know, we had two artists working on it for almost a year just on getting all the different styles and, and looks to his hair. Most of our time was actually spent trying to figure out how to mess up his fur. Through the course of the film, he accumulates damage and also how do we get him wet? And that was something we hadn't really done before with so much uh, fur and water interaction. then where he's lit on fire, essentially. And so that was an entirely new look to the fur, where we have a lot of singed fur and blackened fur. And we had to do a lot of technology development to figure out how do we sustain that damage throughout the film so there's continuity. Kong's scale really demands a lot of time to convey a sense of scale, and you also can use that time for these transition moments. The emotional, quiet moments are more difficult and time-consuming to get right than the, the broad action beats. The options are almost limitless as to how a emotional performance can be delivered. It was important for us to show Kong's transition on the ridge with Brie Larson. There's something really beautiful about the fact that Kong is king, and yet he doesn't choose to use that power in a way that's harmful. I just remember the first time I ever was with an elephant, <laughs> and I was like completely intrigued and totally terrified at the same time. Like I kept taking a step closer and then running away and then coming up closer, because there's this gentleness to their soul, but at the same time you know that they are the one with the upper hand. They can crush you at any moment, and yet they don't. I mean, that's kind of where a lot of the inspiration came from for how I was going to feel that moment. The emotional transition on Kong is conveyed all through his eyes. You can see this kind of intensity at the beginning of the scene, and by the end of it, he's go going more wide-eyed, almost as though he's uh, tearing up or willing up because of this connection that he's made with the character. Kill this son of a bitch. In the past, Kong has really gotten the best of by airplanes, so the director wanted to take the opportunity to kind of give Kong the upper hand. Let's show the audience what it would look like if Kong was in control of the battle. I think that the take that uh, Jordan took on this was, was very interesting. He put him into Vietnam, an Apocalypse Now type of scenario. I think it made it visually interesting, a little bit grittier, you know, that kind of throwback to Heart of Darkness sort of feel to it. 
having the, the actual footage from Vietnam with actual Vietnam era helicopters really influenced the look of our all CG environments so that you can not tell the difference between the real stuff and what we created here at ILM. Even though the actual physical shoots happened in Hawaii and Australia and in Vietnam, we wanted it all to look like Vietnam. A lot of that started with building a set of all the mountains. You know, so we had a LiDAR scan and a ton of photography and built a set and then defined like where all of this action is happening. And all of these different areas have their own sort of setups and their own sort of feeling. From sunsets on the ocean with this big storm happening right in front of you, to then seeing a sunset silhouetted by Kong. So it's, it's quite different setups, a lot of different locations. The skull crawlers, it was a real challenge to sort of figure out the anatomy of that creature. The director came to us with the idea that the top of his body and the rib cage should be sort of translucent. You could see the bones through it. So normally we will build geometry inside the body to help with the simulation, but they're not meant to be seen. Finding the way the skull crawler moved was a challenge for animators. You can figure out a lot about a character just by the way it walks, the posture, how fast the steps are, trying to get a sense of weight in there, what the tail might do. We used a variety of reference, everything from Komodo dragons to deer and buffalo. Surprisingly, uh, the way that deer and buffalo get up, they really thrust their heads forward to get their legs out from underneath them to stand up. So that was a, a reference we leveraged in the film to help motivate the skull crawler's performance. From a design perspective, they're creepy. And that's exactly what they need to serve in a story. So that later, when the mama comes out, okay, this is a formidable foe for Kong. For a baby, the skull crawler was still 40 feet tall and about 100 feet long. The mama was essentially twice as big. So, you know, 80 feet tall and 200 feet long. A lot of the focus was on making sure that it felt like this creature could take on Kong. <laughs> A huge challenge for that battle was creating fight moves that felt like animal behavior, not too human looking. You didn't want Kong throwing kicks or anything like that. So you're kind of limited with what type of moves that they can do on one another. And then you also want to take into consideration what their abilities are just based on their design. And then seeing all of that take place, splashing up water and mud, it was intense. The creatures are throwing each other into mountains and throwing each other into the water. And you have to make the environment live up and be something that's suitable for this to happen. That integration with water and the characters happens within the effect department. We, in the environment group, since we're creating everything that happens outside of that center stage, we have to work really closely with those guys to make sure that our water lines line up. With two creatures, it was a constant having to work out how to get them to interact with the environment properly. To make it look real, it takes quite a bit of effort. The complexity of what's in each of the shots was extraordinary. Every shot is really designed for maximum impact. Seems like every time somebody creates Kong for the big screen, they're pushing the envelope visual effects wise. So to be able to have an opportunity to contribute to that legacy was an awesome opportunity. Having a fresh take on something that had already been done and also creating this sort of larger scale and using the new technology to do it was very exciting. Kong is one of the very first creatures ever made for cinema. I think anybody that does this type of work has got to have a little soft spot for Kong. For anybody growing up a fan of visual effects, you know that every Kong film has been a huge technological advancement along with you know, creating this great character. Kong is a part of film history. Skull Island, the land where God did not finish creation. A big part of the film and a big key element was Vietnam. Vietnam in particular is very special because it's never been captured on film before in this way. And action! We're really trying to create a place that is incredibly distinctive and unique and never seen before. And we're one of the first films to shoot in Vietnam on this scale. The decision to sort of say, let's take our whole crew, let's take the actors there, let's not just shoot plates there, let's go. 
Uh, we moved from Phong Na to Ninh Bin. And Eugene has a Vietnamese house. Yeah, I'm rocking all of it. Okay. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm bored. Yeah. Oh, wait, that's pretty, huh? Good morning, Vietnam. How's it going? It became very clear very quickly that this was a place we could put on film and make audiences go wow. Doi da bui, he day and day. This is where uh, the new chapter begins. Um, probably the most spectacular location. No offense, Hawaii and Australia, um, but this is the this is new territory. Places unseen. See you there. We are in an area called Quang Binh Province. It's central Vietnam, and this specific area is called Tan Hoa. It's mostly a, a, a farm community, and you can get these incredible, vast landscapes, 360 degree you know, views with not a structure in sight. You know, for most Americans, their primary a uh, touchstone of Vietnam is obviously the war, and most of that, most of those photos took place in the, in the South, and it's a very different landscape in the South. And you go up into northern Vietnam, it looks like a map painting. It looks like something someone created in a computer. This is bananas. This is gonna be absolutely insane. You already? You walk out your door sometimes, or you step out of a van and you see shapes in the landscapes that you didn't know existed in nature. It's beautiful, are you kidding me? Look at this. This is un unbelievable. Perfect. Okay, I could totally understand now why Jordan was set on really wanting to shoot here. Vietnam has been truly breathtaking. Awesome. I haven't been ceased to be amazed yet, but after this, I think it all stops because this is amazing. Like you don't you don't find places like this on earth, you know what I mean? Oh, oh. yeah. If you get halfway up a staircase in rural Vietnam and no one's around to hear it. Did it really happen? My favorite thing really has been meeting the people. They're just so friendly and warm and excited to see us. And they know it's King Kong and they're pretty excited about it. I mean, front row seats, right? Never, never seen such a beautiful and handsome uh, actor. <laughs> Surely. They're very warm people, the Vietnamese. Very warm indeed. So sweet and welcoming and hospitality is a big thing for them and it's refreshing to see that. The atmosphere and the culture, they're all amazing. And so it's its this perfect package of just this untapped place in the world that I don't think a lot of people have thought about traveling to. No one's ever shot a movie like this in Vietnam. And to me, that that's a point of pride. Like, hopefully people see this movie and they're saying, oh my God, where was that? Oh my God, so much fun. This is why we came to Vietnam. And we just truly fell in love with the culture, the people, and everything about this country. And the places there are, they're just spectacular.
Hawaii leg, we've done 42 days here, has been absolutely extraordinary. Hawaii is one of the most beautiful places on the planet. My first day, so we went up in real helicopters and uh, real 70s Hueys flying over the Pacific. It's going to be fun. Be hey, how fast do we want to be <laughs> going? Cause we're here. Things you don't normally get to do in life, let alone in movies. If not, I'll go to the water. Okay. <laughs> So now I have zero fears. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's so cool. And the water is so clear, you could see all the way through. My eyes are like, I feel like, I kind of feel like I'm gonna throw up, but I'm also really happy. <laughs> This is the gambling den we've just shot uh, Conrad's introduction into the film. Now there's a man worth talking to. That's what we did. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that is a wrap on our adventures in Hawaii. It's given us lots of sunsets and blue skies and a lot of laughs. We can't wait to see what they have in store for us down under. We'll see you there. This is me at Covero Hair Department. We're having a conversation about how sweaty I should be. I mean, it's pretty hot out here. It's about 85 degrees. Cool. Cool. Queensland, yeah. Australia, Paper yeah. Bark Forest. I feel like I'm going to get sweaty. Australia is, I find, it's my first time really exploring the, the, the forests of Australia, but it's so wild. There are more creatures, more bugs, more creeper crawlies, more snakes, more spiders. What was that bird? Did you hear that bird? There's a bird that was like in the trees going, you hang a little further back, so. That's calm. Good, cut it. Cut. Yeah. Set. cut. This is uh, Corey Hawkins. I'm no. Houston Brooks. This is, sorry, this is Houston uh, Brooks. Sorry. Um, good. He's wearing a very yeah, fetching uh, sleeveless. This is a military puffer jacket. <laughs> this is for carrying burritos through the jungle. Yeah, I, I, okay. <laughs> it's important, man. We got a mission to accomplish. We are here in a place called Nimbin, um, which is one of our locations for Skull Island. And I'm sitting on a boat. Here she is, she's called the Grey Fox. And in the film, she belongs to um, Lieutenant Hank Marlow, who's played by John C. Riley. She's a sturdy old girl, and today's the day that we, uh, we take the Grey Fox away from its moorings and deeper into the jungle on Skull Island. In case anyone was wondering was who was driving the boat that whole time. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Oh, she's out of focus. The Ely village isn't focused. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Don't quit your day job. Okay. Mm. Ree Larson. Yeah. How do you feel? Um, um, how am I feeling? Uh, it's a combination of, of feelings, you know. I'm feeling 
Excited to be moving away from this mud, but also sad to be saying goodbye to these Ewees. Do you think in another, in another world you'd like to move to this Ewe village? As long as there's like margarita capabilities and a, and a way to charge my Game Boy, I'm fine here. Yeah. Leave me here, actually. I love it here. Look at that, and they're so sweet. They're so happy all the time. I love these Ewees. And I think they love me too. Most people do when they come to Vietnam, you know. Just uh, see the sights and run through a swamp, as you do in Vietnam. The best part of working in Vietnam has been the locations, to be honest. It, the places we have seen, the places we've shot in, are, are places that that have never been photographed on film in the way that they are being now. And the food has been good. <laughs> the food's been great. So Vietnam's been wonderful. I recommend it. <laughs> That's it. That's a wrap. Now it's a wrap on the end day. Captain Conrad, signing off. Driven by his experiences upon the SS Lawton, Supervisor William Randa searched for a mythic island, an obsession that lasted close to 30 years. A multitude of terror searches were commissioned, but none were successful until the advent of Landsat. Through their imaging satellite, the island number 11002039543 was located on April 7, 1973. A joint mission between Monarch and Landsat was launched. We engaged the services of a military helicopter squadron for passage and extraction from the island. This mission suffered massive casualties, including the loss of Randa. However, Monarch operatives Brooks and San survived, returning with their eyewitness accounts and Randa's original field notes. In many ways, the expedition was a success. We discovered a whole new ecosystem, an island of Mutos. None more significant than those hereafter noted as Kong and the Skull Crawlers. During the 1973 mission, Monarch operatives Brooks and Sun discovered native islanders called the Iwi. The following intel comes from their interactions with the tribe, as well as Lieutenant Hank Marlow, who lived with the Iwi until his escape from the island. Marlow's recollections of the Iwi reveal a complex system of communication that also serves as a mode of camouflage from the beasts that inhabit the island. Symbols are written upon their flesh and woven into their clothing, there is very little spoken language, but many subtle gestures that speak volumes. Wrecks of several ships and airplanes lay scattered near their encampment. Some of the vessels appear to be quite ancient, dating back millennia. It has been proposed that the Iwi are not indigenous to the area, but are travelers themselves who were stranded on the island at various points in time. The Iwi scavenge parts to build structures, but mainly appear to use the ships as shrines to the god they call Kong, the alpha superspecies of the island. The superspecies is far beyond the size limitations of any primate seen on Earth. This is no ape. This is, this is something else. 
to the indigenous population of Skull Island, Kong is more than just an animal. Kong is a god. And frankly, who are we to argue? Now, I've never been much a believer in God, but I believe in Kong. beyond classification. Could it be that this realm's predator-prey relationships are so pronounced in their aggression that they... that they drove evolution down a completely different path? Like a, a fusion of plant and animal, not flora, yet not fauna, but something new. It's flora fauna. On Skull Island, I mean, myth, myth truly runs wild. I... Houston Brooks, geological advisor to Monarch, hereby state, on record, that the myth is real. We found it. Skull Island exists, and it's more wondrous and more terrifying than any myth could ever hope to communicate. The discovery of the island reveals an ecosystem teeming with a multitude of mutos, something our scientists had never anticipated. According to Randa's notes, the discovery of the island reveals a self-contained biome in which the path of evolution has skewed into a dramatic new tangent, manifesting life forms that are unlike anything on our planet. There is gigantism beyond any megafauna previously identified. The mammalian life has grown to a scale beyond anything typically found within phenotype. Those who experienced this new world firsthand had similar reactions. Rhonda reported, This planet doesn't belong to us. Ancient species owned this earth long before mankind. Part of Monarch's mission is to locate, study, and preserve the unexplained orders of nature hidden in remote corners of the world. As such, Skull Island creates a unique challenge for our organization. There are two alpha species of Muto on the island. These are in direct opposition to one another. The apex primate Kong, and the hypervore species referred to as skull crawlers. In so many ways, the island is like something from a dream, but these things, they walk out of a nightmare. Kong is the god of the mountain, and this beast is the devil incarnate. <laughs> Operative Brooks's hollow earth theories were tested when the team arrived on the island. The seismic charges released revealed the bedrock to be practically hollow. Unfortunately, this experimentation flushed the skull crawlers out of their subterranean spaces and into direct conflict with the team. They call it the skull crawler. Its hypermetabolism is so accelerated that the creature exists in a constant state of starvation, always hunting, always devouring, and that cold, lifeless skull just stares into your soul. The boneyard is massive, filled with the skeletal remains of every apex predator that got in the skull crawler's way. This isn't just a graveyard, it's a feeding ground. We walk through the bones of Kong's ancestors like walking in the shadow of fallen gods. These things may have made Kong the last of his kind. 